ओम शांति गुड मॉर्निंग सो टुडे इज फोर्थ ऑफ जनवरी एंड बाबा इज टेकिंग अप द सब्जेक्ट ऑफ द हिंदी वर्ड इज रूटना रूटना so there are a few different possible translations of this and generally speaking you get the word sulking and um i think it's probably more comprehensible if you use the expression taking offense because that's really what bubbles talking about and there's another word that um baba is talking about in the murli today which is miami too and miami too is impossible to translate because it's very idiomatic and i think a good um corresponding idiom for it would be the cat's whiskers you know this expression yeah uh our brothers and sisters from india you know this expression no <laughs> so it is a very good corresponding word for me ami to you know me ami to so um in uh in english we say you know so and so thinks they're the cat's whiskers which is about the same as me ami to but it is um translated as do not think that you are clever and um i don't think it's a very good idea <laughs> to practice being stupid um but and to avoid or notice uh that if you are, think you're the cat's whiskers it's not a good idea right? so what shall i say in this morley um the essence is sweet children if you are giving up your weaknesses and still you make a mistake then tell baba uh do not think that you are the cat's whiskers and also do not take offense uh with other people so what baba's talking about is this you have to live somewhere and either you live um with the your lokiks or you live with bks and in india it is considered socially pretty unacceptable to live by yourself and so the option of living by yourself doesn't come up in baba's um description about how you how people live so uh if you live with people who are not bks then they do not live the bk lifestyle and therefore the there is an influence of their lokic lifestyle and um uh a different daily routine different eating habits different um purpose of life all this so if you live with bks um they may not have the behaviors that you think are good but it is nevertheless advantageous to live with people who are living the same lifestyle as you who are thinking about life in the same way as you in the sense that they are living according to gyan they have the routine daily routine of um, bks so if their behavior is a little weird um don't worry about it because you are ultimately better off living in an environment where there is gyan there is proper vegetarian food made in baba's remembrance there is meditation there is study all these things so baba's really 
the murli is about all this. So the question is, uh, what should be in your mind so that you remain very happy? And what should you not get upset about? So the answer is, if you keep in mind that you are studying Raj Yoga and you will become, or the purpose of this study is to become the kings of the sun and moon dynasty, you will live in beautiful palaces. You are now going to the region of happiness, prosperity, via the world of peace. There, everything will be first class. Uh, your body will be very beautiful and free from disease. If you do have an illness in this, your last old body, don't be distressed about it. Take the necessary medicine and move forward. And the song is The Flame is ignited in the gathering, Mehfil. So Mehfil is a gathering of poets. And uh, so they come together, especially um, in the Sufi culture, to sing songs about God. And, and they make that kind of music and they have that kind of poetry. And... Um, also, Baba says, you are the moths and you will go and uh, sacrifice yourself into the flame. Om Shanti. So you children have heard this song many times and Baba has explained the symbolism to you in many different ways. But the people who made this song are unaware about the meaning you have now become the children of the unlimited father. You are children, the souls are children of Shiv Baba, and with bodies you are his grandchildren because uh, you became the children of Brahma Baba, his son, which makes you grandchildren. So this is a large family situation. No other father can say, that you are both my children and my grandchildren. This is a wonder here. All of our souls are children of Shiv Baba, but then Shiv Baba has one child that he took over, he took uh, his body, and that is Brahma, and he took him uh, corporeally, so that makes him a direct mouth-born child of Shiv Baba. And then through him, you are his grandchildren. And there are countless children. All are the children of the one father. And you have now become his grandchildren for the purpose of claiming the inheritance. So the first level of inheritance is the knowledge. And then what you do with your inheritance creates your fortune of the golden age. So no one else can claim this inheritance. You have to become a Brahmin to get the knowledge. If everyone were to become Shiv Baba's grandchild, then they would all receive the inheritance of heaven, which is not possible. And that there's 900,000 people. And so if everybody would go there, then everybody would be a larger number. So Baba says, this is why it is only a handful out of multi-millions who do actually become his grandchildren. It is explained that Brahma, Prajapita Brahma, must definitely be adopted. So she, Baba, takes him over and takes possession of his body. So that is the one adoption, and it is a matter of Shiv Baba entering into his body and taking possession of him. 
she, you children also say that you are Shiv Baba's grandchildren. There is no one else who could say, children, remember your sweet home, sweet home being the soul world. To whom does he say this? To souls. The souls are listening through the physical sense organs, so your ears. No one else can say, I am speaking to souls. The Father says, I am the Supreme Father, the Supreme Soul. I enter the body of Brahma and I speak to you and teach you. There is no other way that I could talk to you. And without a mouth, you can't talk. So I have to enter the body of Brahma and I have to name him Brahma because then only could you be called Brahma Kumars and Kumaris. So you are Brahmins and the definition of a Brahmin is they have to be born twice and they also have to be born through the mouth. And so if you ask the Lokic Brahmins in what way they are children of Brahma, they will not be able to tell you. They would say, yes, we are Brahmins, that means we are the mouth-born creation of Brahma, but in fact they became Brahmins by birth, uh, according to the Brahman caste with Brahman parents, they became Brahmins. So that is a physical creation, but then um, they would say they are the mouth-born creation and then they later became a physical creation. So they can't really explain what is mouth-born creation. They use the term, but they can't explain how they are born through the mouth. They could not be physically born through Brahma. So these are very wonderful matters. The Father will not tell you anything that is incorrect. He is the truth. And we are now becoming truth, that is, people who know the truth. But uh, do not consider yourselves as the cat's whiskers. So uh, what happens among BKs? is there is this very well-known story that is often told to BKs, especially new ones, that there was a rat and he found a piece of turmeric and then he thought he was a grocer. So when you come in Gyan, you get the seven days course and you get very excited because you get clarity about the whole thing, the whole machinery of the cycle, the soul, karma, and everything. Um, and you think you've got it, but actually you've got just a tiny uh, superficial version of it. And um, so then you think, yes, I, I know, uh, but you don't. So even this Dada says, until you become complete, something or another can happen. But you are only concerned with Shiv Baba. People can make a mistake and you can come into conflict with others, but your relationship is with the Father from whom you must claim the inheritance. So who are the others around you? They are also on the pilgrimage. Um, but um, your involvement is not with them. Your involvement is with Shiv Baba. So a brother or sister may have said something to you. That means they may have um, castigated you. And uh, so then you take offense. So Baba says, even if that happens, don't worry about it and just keep listening to Sheep Baba's Murli. Um, it's okay if you don't come to the center as a consequence of that behavior. 
but at least take the treasures from the Father. What would you do without the treasures? But still, you definitely must stay in the company of Brahmins, because if you don't, then you would be adversely affected by the company of Shudras, and that would cause you to be to become degraded. The company of the truth, the company of Baba, takes you across, and bad company drowns you. So when swans go and stay with storks, their truth is destroyed. So this is all um, aphorisms. And um, the swans are those who, uh, who know the difference between pebbles and stone, uh, jewels and pebbles, and who can separate milk and water. That means you have a refined intellect that you can understand truth. But when you go and stay with people who are materialist, uh, then it erodes your sense of what is true. So company has a big impact. And especially in India, um, generally speaking, there's a large number of people who do not think for themselves. And they, uh, they hold ideas that other people also hold. People, uh, I, I did a survey once to, to check this, and I found that it is to a very large extent that even if uh, they uh, hear the knowledge every single day, as soon as they are in the company of people who think differently, they start thinking that way as well. And uh, so because people are um, in that culture, it's not an individualistic type of culture. In the United States, people very much think for themselves. And if somebody else thinks differently, who cares? It doesn't matter. And... Um, so that's advantageous in Gyan, because if somebody doesn't agree with you, okay, agree to differ, no problem. Only the one father is called the boatman, and the others are those who drown you. So the boatman is you're in the boat of the confluence age, and you're crossing the salty water, the salty channel, and it's got very dangerous currents in it. And if you are not with the boatman, you would drown in it. So that's the current of life, Iron Age life. Uh, no one in this world can call himself the boatman, as a sheep Baba's title, or the guru. Only the one father takes you out of this Tasteless world. Tasteless world means um, near us, and that there isn't any juice in it. Um, so it is said in India that if you've got that juice or fragrance of spirituality, then it has meaning. And so the world at the moment is a bit meaningless, so tasteless, meaningless. And it's also called the ocean of poison, so it takes you across that to the sweet home, the world of nirvana. The father says there are three regions, the world of happiness, the golden age, uh, the world of peace in nirvana, and the world of sorrow and distress, the iron age. So you must let go of the region of sorrow and distress, and go to the world of peace. And this world of sorrow and distress is to be set on fire. Uh, this is a haystack of sorrows. It, it's, uh, uh, the world as we know it is very combustible. Anytime things can erupt into violence and uh, destruction, um, 
arsonists go around. Uh, one thing that just happened in France is that um, there's a culture of setting cars on fire on New Year's Eve. <laughs> Very unusual, but it is uh, there. And this happens in an area called the Banlieue. And um, Paris is a city that is like a, a medieval walled city. And so the Paris, as we know it, is inside. And then but it's big, it's grown, so outside. And so there are these um, towns, like a sprawling set of towns, uh, where the people who are recent immigrants, refugees, um, people who are at the bottom of the social scale, they live there, and they are um, they have quite a hard life because they're not considered acceptable by the Parisians and so they get angry and then on New Year's Eve they'll burn cars and so this is understandable but um, because there's so much social difference in the world that people who are uh, disadvantaged get angry and create fire People who are corrupt, like Kumbhakarna, live in this world. People call out to the purifier father, but there's no question of calling out to the purifier Ganges, because the Ganges is already here. You know, calling out, but calling for, calling for the Ganges to come. But Ganges is already here. The Ganges River is there in India. <coughs> All the time. <coughs> Bit dry from the heating. <coughs> so the Ganges is there in heaven and in hell. So if the Ganges were the purifier, then everyone would already be pure and nothing would be impure. But the people don't understand anything. Everything is explained to you children at this time and you understand number-wise according to the efforts you make. So the efforts you make to understand has to be about churning uh, because this knowledge is very different from other uh, um, assumptions about what life is and a lot of people can't see the difference between this and not this. But if you churn it, then you, you see it very clearly. Uh, so Baba says, um, also, your lack of understanding is because you have weaknesses. So the weaknesses uh, take the form of excuses. So each one has uh, false pride, lust, anger. So ask your heart, what is my weakness? And most of it has to do with false pride or arrogance. So tell Baba about it. Tell Baba, Baba, I have this weakness in me. And if you don't tell Baba about it, the weakness will grow. So Baba is not cursing you by telling you this, but he's just telling you this is a law of spirituality, that if you hide your weakness, it intensifies, and if you expose it, it um, reduces. And um, why people don't want to expose it is because they don't want to lose face. But Baba says, okay, you 
say that you're giving up all your weaknesses, but then you make a mistake because the weakness is still there, then you should tell Baba about it, saying, Baba, I made this mistake. I stole this or that item from Madhuban or from the center. It's quite interesting. A lot of things do get stolen. You receive everything from Sheik Baba's treasure store. You receive the imperishable jewels of knowledge, and you also receive everything for the livelihood of your body. So he's talking specifically about those who are living in centers or living in Madhuban. So they are dedicated ones or surrendered ones, so they get what they need. You receive everything. You receive nourishment for your intellect, murli, and you receive nourishment from your body for your bodies, a Brahma Bhojan. So if you still want something, you can ask for it. If you take something without asking, then others who see you doing that will also do the same thing. So it's better to ask for it. When a child asks their father for something, he gives it to them. Wealthy parents would be able to give everything for their children, but the poor parents are not in that position. This is Sheep Baba's treasure store. So if you want something, you can ask for it. And everyone will get everything according to their worthiness. So worthiness has to do with your karma. So if you have in your karmic account a lot of positive karma, then all sorts of things will come to you. Good intelligence, good place to live, good health, good relationships, money, this or that. And um, when you are in the big BK gathering, um, there's a big difference in terms of, you know, because it's a family business, because we are in this family business dealing in the jewels of knowledge. And so some deal better and some not so well. So uh, according to that, you're, you're put in some rank. So there are ranks in the BK world. It's a hierarchical world. Some people don't like that, but it is what it is. So Baba says, do not compete with Baba, Mama, and the Ananya children. Do not compete means uh, do not assume that you should be um, positioned in the same rank as them and get the... Um, get the things that they get. So even Baba sings praise, such and such a child does very good service. And therefore you children should also have regard for that child. So uh, there are different hierarchies. One is age hierarchy. So you respect those who are older and the other is competence hierarchy. So you respect those who are more competent. Uh, other is wealth hierarchy. You respect those who have more money. And so there are all these different hierarchies. And for Baba, the hierarchy of importance is if you um, understand the knowledge and you do yoga accurately, so then you would do good service, then the family business will expand. So have regard for someone who is doing good service. Baba says everything depends or your worthiness depends on your knowledge and yoga. So how much knowledge you understand and the quality of gyan, the quality of yoga. Sensible children means wise. If you're wise, you will conduct yourself very strategically because there's a strategy for functioning in a hierarchical system where there are many different hierarchies going on. And so if you are um, 
very clear about what is greater or who is greater than who, then you would you would know. Yeah? So those who are wise, they know if someone is higher than they are. So consider that person with regard. There are some women who are very well educated, very shrewd, and they speak to each other in a polite, respectful way. They understand the protocols. There are protocols. So if you don't know the protocols, nobody will tell you. You have to just know. And there are some who are uneducated, and they speak to others very impolitely, and uh, they're disrespectful. So in this family, one has to have good manners. There are many different kinds of people who come to the Father. So you give gyan to the full social spectrum, and from all levels of society, people come, and not everybody understands the ways of Baba. So Baba asks anyone who comes, are you happy and content? If someone is an officer, that means um, an official from the Indian government, uh, they must also be treated with respect and regard. The Pope has come, the highest uh, person of Christianity. So tell him, this is a forest of thorns. And what you call paradise, we call the garden of flowers. And there must definitely be very good angels living there. Angels means pari. Pari is not angels, but something else. Uh, uh, we have to be clear about the different categories of human beings who are in heaven. So angels are only in the subtle regions. And these pari are like very pure and beautiful people. They're living in heaven. And this is a forest of thorns. And so in the forest, in the jungle, you just find uh, thorns and wild animals. And this Baba can say what he wants to anyone because he's the authority, but it doesn't give you children the right to say these things to other people. So par paradise is now being established. This is the Iron Age, and the Garden of Allah is being established. The Golden Age is the Garden of Allah, and this is the Jungle of Thorns. So these matters have to be understood very well. Those who are fortunate can understand very well and they can explain to others. Baba gives you children good advice. Conquer the five vices and they will continue to have to take leave from you until the end because until then one weakness or another will still be there. So continue to make effort to overcome them. Become soul conscious. Remember the region of peace and the world of happiness. And you will be happy that you are going to the world of happiness and prosperity via the region of peace, the soul world. And by that time, all the cleansing, purification will have been done. <clears throat> and then when you arrive in the world of heaven, everything you get will be first class. We will go there and build palaces that are inlaid with diamonds and jewels, and we will do this and that activity. It is 
in your understanding, I am a soul and I have come here to establish my kingdom. Yes, my kingdom, your kingdom, Baba's kingdom. So you're creating your own kingdom. We will then return back to the soul world with Sheep Baba. Right now we are studying Raj Yoga and we will then become the kings and queens of the sun and moon dynasty. So palaces will have to be built. So you have to live somewhere in the golden age. By churning these things, you will experience great happiness inside. There are still many weaknesses. Many of you still become body conscious. These are the old costumes of the end, and you will receive new costumes in the golden age. <laughs> Baba is sitting here explaining to you, sweetest children, you have been doing bhakti for half the cycle for the purpose of meeting God. So, do you do bhakti to attain God or to attain many others? So, bhakti should be only of one. Uh, but as time goes by, and you start remembering different gods and goddesses, so it becomes <clears throat> adulterous. Then you go for many gurus, birth after birth. Then you have a guru in one birth, you take rebirth, you have to take another guru. So the father says, I am now taking you to heaven. So you won't need to take a guru for birth after birth. So from engaging in adulterous bhakti, it had to become, uh, uh, so from being unadulterous bhakti, it had to become adulterous because it is the stage of decline. So the father says, children, now you have to return to the home. That means your love and remembrance is scattered to many people, gods and goddesses, gurus, and friends, relatives, all these people, your, your focus of attention is scattered. And when you come in Gyan, you're, uh, it's a process of focusing on one and gradually uh, letting go of all of this fragmentation and making it one single. So people sing of me, you are the liberator, the boatman, and the master of the garden. Heaven is a garden of flowers. So once you have arrived at your destination, then the boatman will go. So Sheep Baba is the boatman, he takes you to heaven, and then once you're there, he'll disappear. Not everyone will go to heaven. And for those who go there right at the beginning, it will be as if they have arrived in the garden of Allah, and they will experience a lot of happiness. Allah alone gives everyone happiness. And anyone would say, that the golden age is the garden of Allah. So Bharat is the ancient land. And at the time when the sun and moon dynasty kings ruled, the other souls were there in the soul world. People do bhakti in order to go into liberation but there are no gurus who would give them liberation in life. Shiva Baba is the only one who shows you the path to liberation mukti and jivan mukti. Right now, this is the world of sorrow, jivan band. It's a life of bondage. 
and it is a combustible world that has to be set on fire. There is a, it says here haystack, but it's not exactly a haystack. There's something more combustible, which is called a bambur. And in the Punjab, where they grow a lot of rice, they have uh, chaff from the rice, which is extremely, uh, like flies away in the wind, and it's very uh, combustible. Like in California, you have grass fires, and this is why the fires are so fast and huge. And he's talking about that very, very combustible material. So the cycle cannot be of hundreds of thousands of years. And when people think that it's hundreds of thousands of years, it means they are asleep in the sleep of Kumbhakarna, which is the sleep of ignorance. So God has now come to awaken you. So then you must awaken others. You cannot claim a high status unless you do service. And Baba sees that you children are not claiming your full inheritance. Some are, some are not. And so he feels merciful. And the Father would enable all of you to make full effort. So people are wondering, what is God's love? Is it conditional, unconditional? So he's also saying something that's uh, relevant here. Uh, he does, on his side, he does everything to enable you to get what you can get. Um, I said, why shouldn't you become threaded in Baba's rosary of victory? It is very easy to explain this knowledge to anyone. But if you don't do it, and he can't do anything about that. Establishment takes place through Brahma. And the world of sorrow is destroyed through Shankar. What is Shankar? Shankar is when you're completely focused on God, your third eye is open, and you are bodiless. This causes destruction. Now, you must make effort to go to the world of happiness. But no one knows about the world of happiness. And if they knew, they would go there. But no one knows about it, so they can't go there. And their wings are broken. You are the conquerors of death. You are victorious over death. Only the Father, the great death, enables you children to become conquerors of death. What is conqueror of death? That you leave your body by your own volition. So therefore, imbibe all this and enable the impure ones to become pure. If somebody just gets impressed by what they see and hear and they go back home as they were before, then what was the benefit? It's when you take the seven days course that you can be fully colored by this knowledge. But as um, people continue, some children get offended uh, with their teacher for one reason or another. And then because of that, they also get offended with Shi Baba. So is it a good idea to take offense at what God is telling you? So if they get offended by others, it's okay. But don't get offended with me, because if you get offended by Sheep Baba and turn away from him, then you would be like dead. So do not take offense against Sheep Baba. Continue to take the treasures. Wealth never diminishes when you donate it, and you also need good company. 
You must live together like milk and honey in the Brahmin world. But there are some who gossip and tell stories about each other. It's a character assassination. Be very wary of people who do that. The father explains, children have great interest in doing service and rescue those who are drowning. In this also, the expression charity begins at home applies, so take care of who's immediately around you. First of all, the first one Baba uplifts is the child Brahma. So you also should uplift your children. Give them the donation of life, Jiyadan, that spiritual life. The study must be studied until the end. The father gives you very good points. Die alive and claim your inheritance. What happens when someone dies is they let go of everything and they become light. And whatever is the consequences of their karma, they take it. So uh, you can be like that. A die alive means, Baba, I belong to you. You don't belong to any of these other people. I belonged to you before, and now I have become yours once again. So I will definitely claim my full inheritance from you. And the haystack of this world of sorrow and distress is to be set on fire, and we are going to the world of happiness so there should be so much happiness. Acha. To the sweetest, beloved, long lost, and now found children, love, remembrance, and good morning from the mother, the father, Bab Dada. And the spiritual father says, Namaste to the spiritual children. The spiritual children say, Namaste to the spiritual father. So the essence for dharna, give regard to those who are good in knowledge and yoga and who do very good service. Uh, talk to them politely and respectfully. Do not take offense with each other. Secondly, live in the Brahmin clan like milk and honey and protect yourself from gossiping, tale-telling, and thinking about others. Uh, character assassination. Definitely stay in the company of the truth. And the blessing is, may you be free from all attractions. So sense perception means attraction and repulsion. So... Be free from repulsion as well as attraction. And then experience the flying stage with your double light stage. The time for the ascending stage is now over and it's now time for the flying stage. And the sign of the flying stage is being double light. Any burden will bring you down. So anything negative becomes pressure to push you down. Uh, whether it is a burden of your sanskaras, the atmosphere of some relationship or connection with another soul, any type of burden will create uh, pressure. So do not have any attachment, assumptions and expectations. Uh, you expect people to behave a certain way and they don't. Okay, right? Um, when, when you expect people to be a certain way and they're not, and you get uh, affected by that, that's attachment. So do not be attracted by any attraction. When you are free from attractions, you become double light, and then you will be able to become complete. So the slogan is, become a magnet of love. 
so that even those who defame you will come close to you and shower you with flowers. And then uh, the last um, phrases, experience the stage of being merged in love. Become merged in the Father's love in such a way that the consciousness of I and mine finish. Stay merged in the Father's remembrance on the basis of knowledge. <clears throat> and this merging is called the stage of being merged in love. When you become merged in love, that is when you are lost in love, then you are Bapsaman, like the Father. Like the Father, because you, you merge yourself into God, you focus on God, and there's nothing to pull you down or away, so then that's, that's it. So that's a very good stage of um, being merged. So from yesterday, there were still a lot of um, responses coming about whether the love of God is conditional or unconditional. So maybe it's a good idea to analyze this word condition and also to look at why a person would say um, God must love me unconditionally, whether I'm good, bad, or indifferent. And why do they say this? It's because in the religious environment, there is a tendency of the authorities of religion to threaten people that if you do not comply with this or that, then God will not love you. And I think this is where it all comes from. And I think it's really very important to make a very clear distinction between God and um, authorities of religion. Authorities of religion can be the head of a religion, um, but it can be anyone who uh, takes the name of God and uses it to threaten people and control people and um, modify their behavior. So behavior modification is a big percentage of religion. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, in uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition, there is something called the Ten Commandments. You've heard about them, right? And in the Ten Commandments, there are four of them which have to do with your relationship with God and six of them that have to do with your relationship with other people. That means it's 40% uh, pay attention on God and 60% behave the way we tell you. And um, these commandments are um, mostly starting with the word do not. Uh, do not steal, do not kill, do not uh, try and get away with somebody else's wife, um, this type of behavior. And the nature of the human mind is that it doesn't understand the word no or not. No and not is in the intellect, but in the mind, um, if you say, do not be stupid, the person hears, you are stupid. Because that's the mind will take the word, whether it's prefaced by positive or negative, doesn't make any difference at all. And if you say, this red apple is green, the mind will try and figure out a green and red apple. 
Or if you say, do not think about a green apple, immediately a green apple comes in the mind. Uh, and so this uh, system of behavior modification is all about do not have this weakness, do not steal, do not lie, do not this, do not that, do not the other. And so people uh, will um, uh, who find themselves in any relationship where they're in power over someone else, whether it's a parent over a child or a husband over a wife or a teacher over a student or a school monitor over those who are not monitors, they will come at these people in a lower position uh, with this aim of behavior modification. And when Baba talks about this, um, uh, avoid people who gossip and tell tales and character assassination and all that, it's the same people who will say, well, this one does this wrong and this one's dress is not right and this one's haircut is not right and this one's tie is crooked and this one's shoes are not polished. And it's all about finding fault. And then they say, well, it's not me who's finding fault, but I'm just letting you know that unless you do what I want, God will not love you. You see? And it's really, I think, in that context that this idea of unconditional love emerged in the first place because um, actually whatever people say about God not loving someone or another is nothing to do with God. It's all to do with the people who are interested in other people's behavior modification. And it's very, very widespread um, habit of people who come in a little bit of power that um, makes them feel they have the right to correct people and make comments and, 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 and to display that they have power. And if they have power, they're representing God. And if they represent God, then they have a right to tell you that if you don't do what I want, then he will not love you. You see, and then Baba will say, you're a bit body conscious if you think like that. <laughs> but the person may not get it. So as Baba said in the Murli, there's a lot of false pride. So this comes like that. Now, if we want to really see what does God really think about people, and he talks about that he uh, operates in a manner of reciprocity, and we need to understand about reciprocity. And he does talk about this a fair amount. He doesn't use that word, but that's what it is. And, um, you know, he will say, if you remember Baba very well, then Baba will love you. And Baba loves you anyway, no doubt. But the law of karma in terms of your relationship with God operates. The law of karma covers everything your relationship with yourself, your relationship with God, your relationship with matter, your relationship with other people, all this is covered by the law of karma. And there are not very many people who think about how the law of karma functions in their relationship with Shri Baba. But it does. And um, what I have seen in um, people's thinking about God's unconditional love is that the relationship between God and his children has no connection with the law of karma, uh, but it does. And he explains that it does. And so we have to think about it. Sometimes people um, want to know why 
to be case of a bog. And they say, it is a ritual. Why do we do rituals? We're not supposed to do rituals. But there is a karma between the soul and God in this, which is quite worth knowing about. And in the beginning of the yagya, there was no question of offering bog. It came later. And um, Brahma Baba decided that we should do this um, because um, offering bog is uh, a, a communication from a person to God, which means I know that you are the one who takes care of me and provide for me, and so it is an acknowledgement of that. And so he decided that the reason we are not having enough food to eat, and that was the circumstances of it, <clears throat> because he was trying to think, you know, God is the provider, so how come we don't have enough food to eat? What's the problem? And he thought, well, the problem is that we're not acknowledging it, that he's the provider. And so we should acknowledge it by offering bog to Baba. And, of course, they would go in trance and physically offer to Bab Dada in the subtle region. And, um, and this changed the situation around. Um, sometimes when people are uh, uh, experiencing that they're not able to connect with Baba in yoga. And they will say, I can't remember Baba, etc., etc. And uh, one very good way around that is to actually talk to Baba. Because some people, they just sit in front of the picture, just in silence, and they say, this is meditation but it's not communication. So when you talk to Baba, um, it's as if you are communicating with him and you're opening up the channels of communication. So when you talk to Baba, then Baba can respond. And so that is also karma. You communicate with him, he'll communicate with you. And it's a reciprocity. You do something, he'll do something. So what does he do from his side is he comes every day and he tells us the knowledge. And Daddy Janki was very specific uh, in telling us, look, God's love for you is he gives you the knowledge. And he gives it to everybody who is um, practicing Brahmin ways. And... Um, in the early days, the Murli was exclusively and limited to those who are known to be vegetarian, celibate, clean, all these things. And now uh, the Murlis are all over the internet. And so anybody who wants to can listen to it. But... Um, uh, you will only really understand it if you have this relationship of student and teacher. And so the first level of being a student is to study the information, to uh, process it, and to act on it. And so there, there is also a karma between you and Baba as the student with the teacher. You are studying it, you are attentive, and so you're creating a situation where you have a reciprocal relationship with God the teacher. And he says, have all relationships with me. And having all relationships with him means that your um, engagement uh, with one from whom you receive is operational in all the different formats 
in um, relationship where you get something because relationship is all about receiving. And so you receive something and then you have to give the return of that. And so you receive something from God, you don't give the return of it, then you won't be able to receive because you haven't set up this matter of give and take. So karma is give and take, relationship is give and take. So we have to have give and take. Otherwise you take and you can take only to a certain point and then there's a cutoff point. And if you say unconditional love, the meaning of that or the implication of that is he has to give me everything and I don't have to do anything back. And uh, that's unconditional. And um, he definitely will be there. He is ready for anyone, but there, this reciprocity is a law. It's a spiritual law. And if you operate a, a disregarding that law and assuming that it doesn't exist, then um, actually you will get deceived. So uh, I think it's important to understand this word deception uh, because if your ideas are incorrect, then the consequences of operating on the basis of incorrect ideas is that what you assume will be the result of how you operate, you will not get that result. And then you will feel shortchanged. Um, but the reality is that you will have been deceived by thinking that something is true which is not true. And so when Baba comes along and says, you know, I am the truth, and in the Murli today he says, I am the truth, and you study this and you become the truth too, that means to say that you know what is true and what is not true. So uh, a simple example, it is true that water will boil at X degrees Fahrenheit. And if you want it to boil at some other temperature, the lower or higher, if it's higher, it'll evaporate. If it's lower, it won't boil. <laughs> That's just the nature of the beast. The boiling point of water is so-and-so temperature. So this is the law of physics. And um, these things that we are working with, these are the laws of metaphysics. So metaphysics means whatever is outside the range of physics, which is spirituality. And so these laws of spirituality <clears throat> are what we're studying here. And so if you study something, but you don't get it, then... Um, you will, you will not get the results that you want because you are saying that your idea of the laws of spirituality is accurate and God's idea is not accurate. And so he will say, well, <clears throat> if you want to carry on thinking like that, you're welcome. But the problem is that you will not get the results that you anticipate. And then in that case, you will feel um, shortchanged, you will feel betrayed, you will feel uh, what happened, you know, it, it didn't work out the way I intended. Well, because <laughs> you changed the laws and the laws of spirituality cannot be changed any more than the laws of physics can be changed. Because these laws are not invented by people. Uh, they can be discovered, the laws of physics get discovered by scientists, mm -hmm. but the laws of spirituality cannot be discovered. If they could, they would have been, because people have been trying to discover them for a long time, and they have come up with um, formats 
of what the laws of spirituality are, but but they have not got it right. And because of that, Shri Baba comes and says, okay, let me tell you what it is. Do you want to know? And we say, yeah, we definitely want to know. Tell us. And then he tells us and we say, oh, we don't agree. He says, well, okay, if you don't agree, that's fine, but um, I will tell you the truth because I am the truth. And if you don't agree, that's up to you. And um, But don't come and complain <laughs> when it doesn't work out. And so this is basically the thing. And And what it's about is that this concept of unconditional come is invented by some humans. We don't know who invented it. It came into the general usage fairly recently, and we don't know where it started, but it doesn't come from God. However, there are many, many BKs who adopted it, thinking that, oh, this is the kind of thing Sheep Baba would say, so therefore he must have said it, which is actually faulty logic, because you may think it's the kind of thing that he would say, but then you have to check, did he say it? You see, so if you find any Murli where he says there is unconditional love, then show it to us, because... We haven't found any Murli like that so far. But he does talk a lot about reciprocity. And if you think about reciprocity and how that operates in human relationship as well as in your relationship with God, <clears throat> even in your relationship with matter, with nature, you know, if somebody buys you a beautiful plant and you put it somewhere and you don't water it, it will die. Or you put it in a dark place, it will wilt. Because the plant has to be cared for with water and uh, sunshine and fertilizer and all the things. And, and love is also something that has to be nurtured. And this reciprocity is a very important um, um, part of it. <clears throat> so, you, you to have a, re, a good relationship with lots of people requires a huge amount of energy and power, and mostly people don't have that much energy or that much power. So, therefore, it's wise to select, okay, who are you going to give that much attention to? So, in your selection process, who is a person that you would be willing to give that much time and energy to? And what happens, you know, people, they say, oh, this is a very interesting person. Let me develop a relationship with them. And then something happens along the way, and you say, uh-oh, there's a problem here. I think I better put some distance because I encountered some, some quite severe character defects in this person, which means that I don't want to be so involved with this person. And, and you will find that sooner or later with pretty much anyone except God. And, uh, this is very interesting, you know, that there is a person who is not a human, who knows exactly how to relate at every level, and who is a mine of very interesting characteristics. Uh, so it's actually very worthwhile to make this relationship and to make it total and then to investigate, okay, what's involved in having a relationship with God at that level. Um, and, and he tells us in the Murleys all the time so many things 
whose ultimate purpose is to, like it said in the end, you know, merge in love with God. But the precursor to getting there is you have to realize who he is and his characteristics and the laws of spirituality are very important to know so that you can have uh, the total relationship with him and still be living with all kinds of people who have all kinds of good and bad sanskaras. I see, because she, Baba, doesn't have any bad sanskaras. You haven't encountered anybody like that before. <laughs> so, anyway. Om Shanti. There's a question. Um, <clears throat> how can we maintain the merged in love stage all the time? Uh, I think it's useful to consider that this any stage is like a perfume. And um, when you light an incense stick, you can smell it for the first few seconds and then you can't smell it anymore. It's still there. The room is being filled with that fragrance. Someone who comes in will smell it for a few seconds, and then they won't smell it anymore. And um, it, it's also like peak experience. And if you have a peak experience all the time, it's not a peak experience anymore. And so the mind is such a thing that um, experience is something that's a peak. And when you are experiencing just normal life in a normal way, nothing particular going on, you'll say nothing's happening. But you're alive, you're healthy, you had food to eat, you're breathing, everything is fine. But you won't call it a peak experience. So anything that's all the time is not an experience. And so it is actually um, uh, misleading to assume that the word always means that you should be on some kind of high at all times. Even if you are the most dedicated drug addict and you want to take heroin or ice or whatever the thing is that you like, um, your high will last for a little while. And that high is always followed by a low. And the low gets lower. And in order to get a higher a high that's even the same level or not even quite that much. You have to take more and more and more of the stuff, you see. So um, one person yesterday was saying something quite interesting that um, to be a BK, you have to be an addict. And I thought, ah, that's interesting to be an addict. But when you uh, look at this um, question, uh, that you want to feel something intense and you want to stay at an intensity level in terms of feeling that is exactly an addict. And um, uh, an, an ad when you have an addiction, um, you're always going to be disappointed. That's the nature of the thing. So I think it is better... Uh, not to think that being in a stage is the same thing as experiencing a high, uh, but it's something that you need to, oh, you, you will feel it time to time for a few moments, uh, but you can know it. And making what you know very clear for yourself whether or not you feel it is much, much better because you will never be disappointed 
and you will never be frustrated. You will know. I'm a soul. You don't feel it all the time, but you know. And you know, I'm a child of God. You don't feel it all the time. You know. And, and merged in love, when you use the word stage, you are thinking that the word stage is synonymous with the word experience, but it actually is not. Um, the stage of being merged in love when it's not an experience is that you know that you are um, not concerned with other people and that you are detached. And that, that means that you are fulfilling all the relationships with Baba. So you are merged in love, and sometimes you'll feel it and sometimes you will not, but you are. Another uh, uh, analogy is you know very well that you have your eyes and ears and nose and mouth and feet and stomach and lungs and whatnot, but you don't feel them until you get sick. <laughs> you know, oh, my finger is hurt. So your whole mind goes on your hurt finger. Otherwise, you never think about your finger. So I think we have to really stop assuming that we have to be in this high at all times in order to be a Raj Yogi. So again, the word karmatit is not a feeling. It's a recognition that I have finished my karma because the signs of it will be there. It doesn't mean that you feel karmati. You are karmati. Um, uh, it's also, you know, Baba had said about omnipresence. He says the, this concept of omnipresence is a feeling, not a fact. And... Um, and even when people say, I feel God is everywhere, they don't feel that all the time. It's just occasionally. And then they make a conclusion from that feeling, which is an incorrect conclusion. And now here, you have to have a conclusion that is correct, which is not contingent upon having that feeling all the time. Uh, I, I hope that that's clear. Mia, me too. <laughs> Mia, me too. Uh, of course, um, I do not know the equivalent expression in German language. Uh, Rene is from Munich. Um, so, Mia, me too. We have to discuss it with each other to find out what would be the German equivalent. But it's like, you you think you're the greatest because of some small thing, but you're actually not the greatest because that small thing doesn't is not um, a reason to conclude that you're the greatest. Something like that. Okay, there's a question about um, the Brahmins of India consider themselves to be born of Brahma. Um. There are a few Hindus in the center who are from Brahmin families. And I found in the internet that Brahmins come around the same time as the Gupta Empire, which was from 320 to 467. Does this mean they did not exist prior to that time? Um, could be, could be. Um, uh, I, I have not explored the history of Brahmins according to the Lokic historical record. So, but in terms of religion, which is um, what people say, what people believe, when a when a person is born in a religious Brahmin family where the Brahmins are full-on Brahmin priests and everything, uh, they will be told, you are born through Brahma. 
and that's how you're a Brahmin, something like that. Um, and uh, I don't ne- think that they will necessarily be given a full explanation because Baba's point in the Murli is if you ask a Brahmin if they're born through Brahma, they'll say, yes, we're born through Brahma. And then if you say, well, how did that happen? They won't be able to tell you how. Um, there's another question. Is selfless love unconditional? Uh, no. Um, selfless love or altruistic love is that you um, do not take anything in exchange. And uh, so altruism means love for others. Uh, selfless is you don't take anything in exchange. But what Baba says is that you may claim to be altruistic and you may claim selfless love, but the law of karma will get in the way of that because um, no matter what you do, which is based in love, there will be a return for for it. And so you cannot function without a return. And then this word unconditional is different because uh, unconditional is not connected with um, this idea that you will love and not get anything in return. The word altruistic is discussed in that way. And um, uh, I think you need to make a separation between altruistic, separate, uh, selfless, and unconditional, because this word conditional has this meaning, if, then. If you do this, then God will love you. And you say, I don't want to do this, but I want him to love me without me doing what is necessary to get his love. And so he says, it doesn't work like that. It's a faulty logic. So the idea of altruistic love is incorrect understanding, which is not the same as faulty logic. Right? So these are hair-splitting things, but <laughs> it's, that's how it is. But, I mean, when you, when you want to churn these things, you, you have to look at them and say, okay, now what does this really mean? And this word conditional is a word that's used in logic. It's used in um, computer programming and things like that. And, and it has a particular meaning. And you cannot change the meaning of a word and get away with it. Because someone will come along and say, you're using this word incorrectly. And um, it is a problem that people generally use words incorrectly. It's very common. Um, but it it um, causes you it causes you to think in a fuzzy way, and um, sometimes Baba uses the word accurate. You hear the word accurate, so accurate means precise. So if you use a word precisely according to what it means, then you will communicate what you want to say. But if you use it in an imprecise way, then people will not actually understand what you mean, and so they will assume something which may or may not be what you mean, because what you said was unclear. And so, uh, and this is a, a global problem, a lack of precise communication. But if you look at the language of Baba, he speaks in 
a combination of Hindi, English, Farsi, Urdu, Arabic, uh, Sindhi, Gurumukhi, Sanskrit, and maybe a few other things, because he will take the exact word from whichever language has it to say what he means. Because then you churn it, you got it right. And if you have a word that is used for a word that Baba uses, which is inaccurate or imprecise, then your churning will carry you off to somewhere else other than where he wants you to go. Uh, okay, how to distinguish information sharing from gossiping? Um, so gossiping um, is the English translation. So this word gossip is a pretty much of a slang word in English. And um, it's one of these very imprecise words. But what Baba is talking about, what he doesn't like, is when you get together with someone to talk about somebody else behind their back and you're uh, saying things that are an uncomplimentary about that person. This is what he means. And um, suppose you know some bad thing about someone. Uh, he says, oh, why are you spreading that? Even if it's true, but why are you spreading it? Now, that's not the same as whistleblower. A whistleblower is where um, you come to know that something is going on which is actually damaging to quite a lot of people, and that needs to be flagged up. That's different. But when it comes to discussing people's characters, in an uncomplimentary way or spreading stories about their mistakes, which um, is not necessary. Uh, don't do that. Uh, okay, somebody um, asked a question about children. Now, what I actually said is if you have children, you have a responsibility for them. But if you are attached to your children, um, <clears throat> you will not fulfill your responsibility properly because you're using them to fulfill your emotional needs. And that, that's another thing altogether. But there are other people that you're attached to that you're not responsible for. And um, if you can live without them, but it also may happen, uh, something that is a really very, very hard thing <clears throat> is if your child dies. Um, that's very, very hard. But it happens. And you have to be able to get past it. And so, um, because, you know, you have to know that there is nothing that is forever. Nothing and no one and nowhere that will be with you forever. And being attached to a thing or a place or a person, really attached, means that if that person's gone, you are gone. If that thing is gone, you are gone. If that place is gone, you are gone. That's, that's what I mean by attachment. So yeah, you have to be, when we're, when we're discussing these words like attachment, um, uh, you, you have to be realistic, you see. Uh, he says, how do I separate that with my kids? You have to fulfill your responsibility, but do not use your children to satisfy your own emotional needs. That is called... Um, uh, uh, there's a word for it. Um, generation hopping, something like that. You're, you're putting somebody in a lower generation and you're using them as an equal. <clears throat> and that is uh, uh, abuse. 
emotional abuse. You can't do that with children. <laughs> you offer bog. How how do you offer bog? You offer bog however you want to offer bog. You have to think about it. Someone asked this question: Is the subconscious the same as the sanskar? No, sanskar is more like conditioning. But sanskaras from your previous birth are functioning in your subconscious because they drive your um, your behavior. It's very subtle, very deep. I was just thinking that it might be better to use a different word than attachment because in English people say, I'm attached to my kids. That doesn't mean it's a vice. But if you say, I'm emotionally dependent, that's the vice that he's talking about. Because attachment in English is not a vice, but emotional dependence, it weakens you. So um, that's really what it means. Okay, Om Shanti. <laughs>